So we know that in scripture, the religious leaders have a big role in the crucifixion of Jesus. But how does Shmuel and Yanni play into that? Let's talk about the Pharisees' plan. Welcome to this Night Life where we look at creativity through the lens of Christianity. And today we're going to be looking at the Pharisees and Shmuel, Yanni, what is their plan or plans to take down Jesus? For the purposes of this video, we're going to be focusing on season two, specifically talking about episode four and beyond. And remember, if you get any value out of this video, make sure you leave a like for the YouTube algorithm. It'll really help us out. Thanks. Let's get into it. So first off, let's start in episode four. This is when we see Yanni and Shmuel kind of talking for the first time in Jerusalem. Yanni seems to be some sort of mentor to Shmuel, an older Pharisee kind of teaching him the ways, at least in Jerusalem here. The show does an amazing job of showing us that Yanni and Shmuel are connected in some way, other than just both of them being Pharisees. They're obviously friends, they're talking through different things, and Yanni is teaching Shmuel a, a bit of the ropes here. Later on in episode 4, as Jesus is approaching, we see a group of Pharisees at the Pool of Bethesda. Yanni is amongst these Pharisees. He watches as Jesus heals Jesse, and then Jesse picks up his mat and begins to leave, just like Jesus has asked him to. Yo! It's Shabbat! What are you doing? Torah forbids carrying a mat on Shabbat? Not Torah, the oral tradition. Yes, transporting objects from one domain to another violates Shabbat. Now this is a problem for Yanni for two reasons. First, it's the Sabbath, and healing is considered work on the Sabbath. Even though this miracle has just happened in front of his eyes, he's more focused on the law than he is on what just happened in front of him. And then secondly, for Yanni, it's against the oral tradition for Jesse to be picking up his bed and moving it on Sabbath as well, even though this isn't actually in the law. So this makes Yanni pretty upset. In his eyes, people are disobeying the law left and right in front of him, and he's trying to stop it from happening. Now off screen, Shmuel must have had a conversation with Yanni telling him all about Jesus and what he encountered in Capernaum with him as well. And remember, the Pharisees' job is to kind of follow the law and make sure that other people are doing it as well. And so both of them are fired up about this. They believe that this man has violated the law, uh, the oral tradition, and that he has made other people do it as well. And so they start their plan here, at least plan A. And by the end of the season, they've gone through a couple of different plans. So plan A is to amend a report that Shmuel had made about Jesus in Capernaum. But when they get to the clerk, he says that the report has been denied and that it's basically closed at this point. Upon further inquiry, we find out that Nicodemus was the one that was actually behind this report shutting down. This obviously upset Shmuel, but Yanni isn't ready to give up yet. He has a plan in mind. So later on, we see as Yanni and Shmuel are in an office plotting what they need to do in order to trap Jesus. And the conversation boils down to two things. First, Yanni wants to create some political chaos by pitting the school of Shammai against the school of Hillel. Now we've done a full video on this, so if you wanna check that out, go here if you want some more clarification. But a short version is, Shammai is a rigid teacher. He holds to the law no matter what. But Hillel is a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more gracious in the law. But these two schools are the main schools in Judaism, even today. Now at this point in history during the show, Hillel is no longer alive, and his son, Shimon, has taken the mantle of president of the Sanhedrin. So obviously Shimon has taken on his father's teachings, and is a more loose teacher. So the goal is to talk to Shimon's scribe, which Yanni has a relationship with. That way they can get a message to Shimon, so that he can use this whole Jesus thing as a political tool against Shammai. And in turn, this will create a ruckus in the Sanhedrin, making this a bigger deal than it is right now, since Nicodemus shut it down. Yanni doesn't care who's talking about this Jesus guy, but he wants someone to be, so that this whole thing can be out in the air, and so that people can get mad about it and make it a big deal. He's not comfortable seeing this blasphemy going unpunished. Now, Yanni has seen this guy being healed and picking up his mat on Shabbat because of Jesus, but it's always good to have more witnesses. And Shmuel has a few witnesses in mind. In the Torah, the testimony of how many witnesses is required to judiciously establish a fact? Hmm? Two. He thought about his cousin for a little bit, but then there's no way to really find him. And then they thought about Tamar, the Ethiopian woman, who was there when the paralytic was healed in Zebedee's house. Even though she's a woman, maybe her testimony could be used against Jesus. So just like plan A, plan B goes south pretty fast. They meet with Shimon's scribe, and he immediately shuts them down as well, saying that this is not an important matter to the law. There are more important things that we should be focusing on other than this. And so feeling defeated, they go off and they try to find some more witnesses to get some more people involved in this so that they can solve this whole Jesus thing. Now, the next time that we see Jesus interacting with Pharisees and priests is in Wadi Kelt. This is a small synagogue in which Jesus heals the man with the withered hand. Again, 
Jesus healing on Shabbat. It's kind of his thing. Now, more importantly, this is when Jesus openly declares that he is the son of man. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Essentially saying that he is the son of God. And this freaks the Pharisees and the priests out. So much so that this separate Pharisee and priest decide that they're going to do something about Jesus as well. Even though they're from a small town, they're going to get some recognition. They need to stop this heretic as well. We could go to Jatabata. There will be people of import among the protests. We could tell them as well. So the second part of plan B also kind of fails. They don't find Tamar, but there's a couple of reasons for this. One, they make it to the right town and they've heard that she's here, but they can't find her on the stage. And this is because Andrew and Philip have just arrived and began to speak to her about how much danger she's causing for Jesus. And as this conversation continues between Tamar and the man that had been healed in Zebedee's house, a familiar figure steps up, Yusuf, the Pharisee, who we met in season one. Turns out that Yusuf is a very close apprentice to Nicodemus, and he agrees with him on most of the situations that are happening with Jesus. In order to stop Shemuel from what he was doing, he meets up with Andrew and Tamar and warns them about what's coming, about Shemuel. And then Tamar immediately leaves to go be with Jesus, to follow him. But at the same moment, we see as the Pharisee and the priest from Wadi Kelt show up, and they meet Shemuel and Yanni, giving them all the juicy details. So in a roundabout way, in this weird town of Jotapata, they meet their witnesses that they need. So plan B has a little bit of success, I guess. But they still don't have anyone to fight this case for them. They don't have anyone to go to bat for them with a Sanhedrin. And so they decide to pull out the big guns. Now we go to the other side, the rigid one. Shammai. If Shimon won't take this case, let's take it to Shammai, the rigid teacher. The one who has the most votes in the Sanhedrin. So let's watch the scene with Shammai and break it down. That's it? That's your whole story? Everything we know for certain established as fact by eyewitnesses in accordance with the law. <laughs> I know we can't prove it's the same person, but the pattern's too striking to ignore. It doesn't need to be the same person. That's what's wonderful. I will have Shimon dragged for this. To be fair, it was the secretary who called the charges Manusha, not Shimon himself. Secretaries don't put words in the rabbi's mouth. It's the other way around. Manusha. My congregation and students will foam at the mouth when they hear this. Make a written record of your conversation with Shimon's secretary, every word, and file it with the clerk of the Special Council for False Prophecies at the archive. It must be signed and dated by a ranking Levite. Do you understand my instructions? Yes, but why all the exactitude? Because when this Jesus of Nazareth amasses enough followers and enough detractors, it will get Rome's attention, and then everyone will know Know what, Rabbi? That Shimon was well aware of these offenses and dismissed them. His obsession with reforming God's immutable law will be exposed for the negligent, lazy, dangerous abomination it is. Not just Shimon. We opened a case with the Sanhedrin and Nicodemus dismissed it as immaterial. Nicodemus. I've long suspected the lamps were going dim in that house, if you get my meaning. Well, I don't know about that. I... Spread the word. Tell every scribe, Pharisee, Sadducee, Essen, priest, teacher, and Levite you know. Why, Rabbi? First, the facts. Self-identifies using a divine title from the prophet Daniel. Son of man. Claims authority to forgive sins. Violates Shabbat on multiple occasions. And commands others to do so. Eats with tax collectors and sinners. Degenerate. Now, the speculation. Speak it out, I don't have all day. One of John the Baptizer's students is among his followers, and there are rumors of a second. Delicious. We'll never be pestered by that freak again. In Capernaum, there were women of ill repute seen at table with him at the tax collector's house. You're telling me women are among his followers? You asked for speculation. Keep going. He consorts with Gentiles, specifically the Ethiopian woman who knew his name and his origin. The last is very vague and small. Nothing is small when it comes to fidelity to God's law. The Praetor of Capernaum ordered Jesus detained. When I spoke with his office, they made mention of the fourth philosophy. The Zealots? It was just a passing comment. He must be out of his mind. That's all we have. You must make these confirmed facts and inferences made known far and wide, but never mention that Shimon or Nicodemus dismissed the case. The gullible masses will defer to their supposed wisdom, but then 
when we reveal dated documentation showing that Shimon had early warning and did nothing, the house of his wretched grandfather Hillel will fall, and the house of Shammai will rise. Rabbi Shammai, respectfully, we didn't come here today seeking to influence which schools of thought. We came looking for someone who would care that a false prophet is deceiving our people. If that was your intent, you have succeeded. Everything you've shared with me will make an appearance at my next Shabbat sermon. And so this is what we see in episode 8 of season 2. They're meeting with Shammai, giving him all of the details. But here's the interesting thing for me. During the last few episodes of season 2, we start to see a split between Yanni and Shmuel. It's not that Shmuel doesn't want to punish Jesus. It's not that he doesn't want to take care of this whole issue, but it seems to be getting a little bit out of hand for him. Shmuel and Yanni have been trying tooth and nail to get someone to notice this whole Jesus thing. Finally, they get someone that is excited about it, but maybe even too much for them. Shmuel seems extremely uncomfortable during this scene. He's kind of giving Shammai all that he wants, but he's doing it reluctantly. You can see as Shmuel doesn't feel comfortable with speculation. He wants things that are factual. They want to have proof. They want to have all the details laid out in front of them so that it's clear that Jesus was in the wrong, that he did break the law, even though he never did. There's even a point in this scene when Shmuel begins to defend the mischaracterization of Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus was his teacher as well, so he still respects him, even though he may disagree. But here we see the true nature of Shammai, as he is bloodthirsty, not only to settle this law matter, but also to take down his rivals within the political sphere of the Pharisees. Shammai begins to collect every single piece of speculation so that everything can be brought against Shimon. Because now not only is this an issue with Jesus, but Shimon had to have known about it through his scribe. And so if Shammai can bring this up during one of his Shabbat sermons and bring this up to the Sanhedrin, then he can prove that Shimon ignored this blatant, law breaking. So we're not exactly sure where this is going to lead next, but in the end, we know that this is eventually going to get to Caiaphas, to the rest of the high priests, and they're going to trap Jesus. Judas is going to betray him, and they're going to crucify him. But in the very end, we know exactly what's going to happen, don't we? So those are the Pharisees' plans, and I can't wait to see what happens in season three. But until then, comment below what your thoughts are, and thanks for being part of our community. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.